Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. Delighted to have Susanna Lauren from Funko with us today. Uh, Funko is a, an accessibility company based in Sweden. They do some fantastic work all over the world. Um, delighted to have you with us. I've been really interested in the stuff you've been doing, so I think we're going to have a really interesting chat today. Can you tell us a bit about how Funko came into being and, and, and what it is that your organization does? We started out as a non-profit uh, project, really, in the mid-90s. It was all of the, um, of the Swedish disability organizations that came together wanting to develop a web portal for disabled people by disabled people. Uh, and that project was highly successful. Uh, after a couple of years, it was turned into a company. And since the year 2000, we have been working as a consultancy in accessibility and, and usability, both in the ICT domain and also in the built environment. And except for just the consultancy, we also do some research and innovation. And uh, we are, of course, also working with standards and also some large strategic government assignments and so on. So we are, we are doing more than just the ordinary consultancy. Yeah. I, I know you do lots of research because I've been reading your papers, um, particularly interested in the stuff around cognitive and accessibility mm -hmm. that you've done. Google Translate didn't do a bad job on it. <laughs> okay, I'm happy to hear that. Swedish. But um, but it's 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 interesting stuff, um, and and it's particularly of interest to me being dyslexic. So um, I think one of the things we talked about as as a an interesting discussion topic was the idea of text and non-text. The accessibility world spends a lot of time adding text. To describe images, yes. um, which is great and, and really important for people who are blind, but actually a lot more people struggle with text than than, than with images. So you've been talking about work you're doing around um, maybe we should be looking at adding more images rather than just text. So can you tell us a bit more about the work you've been doing in that sphere? Yeah, I think the. One of the problems is that most people that start reading WCAG, they, they get tired after the first uh, guideline. And the first guideline has to do with text alternative. And there's no equivalent that says that a text uh, should also have a non-text alternative. There's no, no one is, is t talking about that. But that should really be the case. And we have done research together with different uh, usability or disability organizations and different end user groups uh, with uh, cognitive disabilities and also people with sign language as their maternal language and so on. Um, and really looking into what they prefer and how they can uh, perceive information in the best way. And it doesn't matter how much you work with the text. Uh, in, uh, according to our research, we can only get around 50 to 60 percent of the users to really understand the text and answer controlled questions on the text, no matter how much we work with the text. And we have certified language specialists that can do really um, easy to read things. But if you add uh, pictures or illustrations or films, you can get another 20 to 30 percent of the users to really understand the, the content. And if you then add sound as well, synthetic um, sound, you can have another 8 to 10 percent of the users really understanding the, the content. So there's a lot to be done there. And still, at least in public sector, in, in the European countries where we work, most of public sector websites are 95 percent text. And that is a real problem. Yes. That's, a, that's a, actually a huge step up, you know, yeah. 20 to 30 percent increase in, in uh, numbers of able to access information is a yeah. massive leap forward. So I'm quite surprised that there hasn't been more, up, you know, greater uptake of, of, of this. Mm, there are things happening, but I, I still think that um, at least our, by, among our customers, uh, most of the people that work with information and communication, they are text people. Yes. So anytime they want to inform or communicate on something, they just jump on the, the keyboard and, and they start writing. And I'm, I'm a part of that problem myself. I'm a writing and reading person. So I, I, I love to write and I love to read. And that means that every time I'm trying to communicate something, I'm writing a long text. And uh, you really need to sort of a change of mindset to, to, to work with pictures instead. And I'm not good at drawing. so. To me, it, it has been a, a big step for me as well, just to, to try to think, how am I going to communicate this in the best way? Sometimes text is the best way. 
mm. but often it's not. And really, you need to to have good people around you working with photos and illustrations and graphs and and films and things like that. And not all of our clients have that. Uh. So I think it will take some time before they can sort of. I don't mean to be rude, but get rid of some of the text people <laughs> yeah. and bring on some Im image people instead and not, not believing that it has to be a Hollywood production as soon as you talk about moving uh, pictures. Uh, it could be really um, a very easy uh, video just filming with your, with your uh, smartphone or something. But it's, uh, it's a long step for them to understand that it doesn't need to have the perfect quality of the video to be a good message. Uh, we're, we're great believers in that here at Access. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but you're not public sector in, in Europe. Uh, no, no, no. No, I appreciate that too. Um, I think it's, it's interesting and I know that um, there's, there's a crossover between that, that particular research and also some of the work that's being done in places like the Matter Center in Qatar where they're looking yep. at symbols. And I know a friend of mine, E.A. Draffen, is, is doing a lot of work on, on symbols and one of the issues that you have with with symbols is actually working out and, and, and sort of picture pictorial representation is that just like written language, symbols mean different things in different lang in, in, in different cultures. Yeah. So trying to actually find symbols that, that translate across borders is is particularly challenging. Yeah. So and until until now we haven't seen many icons that really does the job. I mean um, it's like the save icon uh, on a computer, most people understand what that is, but but today nobody under thirty has ever seen um, the floppy disk. So no. it's, I mean, it's a funny thing. The icon, the power of the icon is not how it, how well it represents the real thing. It is the the way you recognize it and that people have experience from it. That is the the power of the icon. Yeah. And we see we have done uh, lots of user testing also with the uh, the hamburger icon, the yes. menu navigation icon that you are widely used in, uh, in responsive design for on smartphones. And there are huge numbers of users that still do not, do not know what it means. So our recommendation is always to use an icon that is good, but also in combination with text. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. They they make quite good um, coffee mug coasters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would yeah. be useful for these days. <laughs> I think I've still got boxes of them. Um, I I think the 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 other thing with with. Um, Symbols as well is we, we were looking at this for um, the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force, which I'm part of, uh, W3C, and and trying to um, look at symbols that mean stuff to people. Mm -hmm. The the save menu is an obvious one um, in terms of it's anachronistic, but everyone knows what it is. Um, the other thing is I, that frustrates me greatly is um, hidden. UI elements. We're taking more and more things off screen to create real, real, real estate on the screen for you to display pictures and, and stuff. But if it's not there, people can't don't necessarily know that they can interact with stuff. So how how do we actually convey to users, especially new users or, or people that are older and haven't got the experience and, and and don't have the same kind of culture of experimentation as, as younger people, how do we get them familiar with the, the interface? Because I think that's a, a, a fundamental UX accessibility crossover issue where if you don't, can't perceive it, you can't use it. No. And I think um, we'd need to recognize that Many users, probably more than we think of, um, and not absolutely not only disabled people, um, do need time to accommodate to new things. And uh, it's not only about the care for users or users that are not feeling comfortable with new things, but but every one of us. I mean, I 
uh, just now I was I needed to borrow uh, somebody else's computer to do this interview and I feel completely lost because I don't recognize anything on the computer I mean it's very easy I work with computers every day I don't I don't believe I'm I'm the lousiest user in the world but still when I'm in with a new interface I feel completely lost and with a little bit of stress because now Neil is wanting to call me then that makes the cognitive overload so yeah. great so I barely couldn't start the computer I mean that's that's just an example of how we are really forcing users to to do very very difficult things today and we must understand that not everyone is technically interested or feeling comfortable with all these new things and I think when we start doing a lot of new sexy stylish things in the interface a lot of users are having barriers to understand this and it takes much longer than than I think the trendy UX people understand to get everyone on board I think that's very that's very common that if you don't feel uh, comfortable in what you're doing or if you're not really sure of what you're doing I mean I wouldn't press a button when it has to do with money if I wasn't sh sure what what was going to happen and I think it's very natural that we are reluctant to do things that we don't really understand what will happen when I when I click here I mean that's I think the the most common thing would be not to to try. <laughs> I think there is a, a minority that really tries everything, and you know it's uh, good for them. But we are many people that don't do don't act, act like that as as long. Um, I mean, maybe if we're just playing around with something, but but when it has to do with my own computer and my money and and my my security, then then we are a bit careful. And I think that's a good thing as well. I I, I think it's quite interesting because I I've seen things go backwards and uh, sorry forwards and take a leap forward and then then go backwards again as people of banking in particular with the the concerns over security have added layer mm -hmm. upon layer of complexity yeah uh, layer upon layer of cognitive load on users and i've i've seen it go from my parents being able to transfer money to going back to writing checks yeah because the the payoff just wasn't great enough no. uh, in terms of the, you know, they don't really care if the money's going to arrive in three days' time. It's, not, <laughs> um, it's much easier just to write something and put it in the post than yeah. have to deal with stuff timing out and remembering passwords and challenge and response and, and, and all of these things and finding the book where you've written your passwords insecurely and all of the rest of the stuff that older people do. Um, not only older. Oh, I know, I know. But I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty smug. I've got them both with password safes now. So, <laughs> okay, good on you. <laughs> but I think that's true, and it also has to do with the amount of uh, services that we need to do on our own. I mean, it started out at least here. It started out with the banks. So yeah. many people went on and tried to. I mean, we we could do the tax declaration things, and we could do the banking. That was actually actually two things that we could do, and people saw something positive. It was easy to do. You could do it in, in the weekends or in the evenings and that was a good service. But now you need to do everything yourself and you have thousands of passwords and thousands of different interfaces and it gets, just gets too much. So I think it's a cognitive overload not only uh, from the banks being more complex because I agree the, the service is getting more complex but it's also that there are so many different things that we are supposed to do on our own without help. And for me, I have the world's best ICT service support. I mean, the nicest persons in the world that run everywhere and do everything for me. But I mean, like my parents, they don't. They, they can just call me and I'm a complete idiot. So, so I'm just happy if I can help them with anything. Um, so I mean, it, for, for people that do not work in an area where they get a lot of ICT support in, in their work space, I mean, most people are completely lost in this new world. Yeah. 
yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. There's not a not a great deal of consistency between no. <laughs> between these different things, and and to a certain extent, we understand we live in a capitalist society uh, where. They're trying to differentiate their services to a certain extent, but but equally, um, having greater standardization would make life a lot easier. Uh -huh. Absolutely, and I mean in verification and authentication and things like that, I think we could have much more standardized services and then the banks or whatever could, could uh, compete with each other with the services, but we don't need to identify ourselves in 25 different ways. I mean that could be standardized. I think, I guess that also would be more secure. Well, I hope so. Um, I, know, I, I know that the UK government are, are looking at, at uh, syndicating out standardised verification. Yeah. You know, so it's gov.uk verify, I think, is, is what they're working on right now yeah. um, for things like tax purposes, etc. I've yet to see how easy it is. Um, personally, as, as someone that's dyslexic, I have a real problem with passwords and numbers and sequences and everything else. I'm locking myself out all the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to the day where two-factor authentication, maybe two lots of biometric things, you know, yeah. face, thumb, you know, hopefully they won't have cut my head off and my thumb to get access to my bank account. <laughs> so yeah. we, should, we should be good. Um, but so the technology is almost there, but the adoption is actually lagging quite quite significantly behind. I've got a, a, a fingerprint reader on my PC for work, but it won't be, it's not enabled. I work in a lot, we, I work for a large company, we've got 100,000 employees, so things move quite slowly. Mm. But the technology has been built in for into the laptops for, for many years. It would be great to be able to use that rather than me phoning up the service desk on a weekly basis saying, hello, I've locked myself out again. Mm. I think it, it, all of this has to do with um, uh, society seeing, looking at accessibility and usability as something completely different from e-government or security or verification. I mean, there's a lot of clever people working with these things of uh, how to authorize people and, and do identification. But they are, at least uh, where we work, they are rarely even close to people that have experience and knowledge about accessibility and usability. So these different areas seem not to mix, uh, which is uh, uh, very bad for, <laughs> for all of us, because this will just go on and be more and more complex, I think, and, and more and more problematic for users to be actually able to, to use the technology. So I, I think that even accessibility and usability people are, to a certain extent, siloed. So, um, how do you think we can remove some of these artificial walls? The artificial walls between accessibility and usability yeah. or between... Yes, yeah. I think those, those are the easiest ones. I, I would say they're artificial. Some of the ones between the security guys and, and the, the accessibility people, they're probably more real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah, maybe, but I also think it has to do with uh, that we are very stuck in our own uh, way of looking at into things. I think it has to do with uh, with communication. Uh, if, uh, if we put some clever um, security people and some clever accessibility people in the same room for a, a while and gave them coffee and food, maybe then then I, I am sure they could solve at least some of the problems. Um, but accessibility and usability, I think uh, the border is sort of being more and more loose, at least in, in Northern Europe. Um, and uh, we see that many of the usability companies are also sort of uh, coming closer into our areas and we are definitely um, nagging on them to, to be able to let us in in their areas. Um, I think it has more to do with language and, and the way we uh, sell our services so the way we communicate around uh, around what we're doing because none of our clients ever um, complained about or questioned that we are talking about accessibility and usability at the same time and and to me I think again it has to do with regulation and the way we look at the standards because WCAG uh, in our point of view is so technical and has so much to do with, with assistive technology that uh, you tend to, or some people tend to forget that it has all of the soft things and the human things and the cognitive things, issues around it. Um, and when you see accessibility in a broader perspective 
having to do with people more than having to do with WCAG, then usability and accessibility really is the same thing. There is no, there is no border between it because it's just, um, it's just two ways of looking at absolutely the same thing. Yeah. So, I, I, I'm, I'm part of WCAG, I'm part of the working group and um, I have a love-hate relationship with it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love the, the intention. I hate the execution. Uh, it's um, it's very technocratic, and also people only implement the stuff that makes it work with assistive tech. All of the the personal, the human stuff tends to be the stuff that people find really hard. Yeah, they they they, they have difficulty grasping the idea um, that that something's not necessarily one hundred percent machine testable. Um, and, and I think that brings me nicely on to another thing that I'd like to talk about, and that's automatic versus manual. Mm. Yeah, that's a Pandora's box. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have been working the last year for the European Commission on an assignment um, trying to make recommendations um, that has to do with monitoring web accessibility in European member states, because when uh, I don't think it's an if, I think it's a when the web directive will come into force, uh, then uh, it should be, <laughs> yes. Uh, but I think, I, I mean, the Commission is crazy in many ways, but they do not uh, give away money so easily. I don't think they would have given us this assignment if they didn't firmly believe that this web directive will come into force. So I, I do believe it will be there. Uh, we don't know exactly how it will be, um, what, we, what it will cover, but in some way or another, there will, I'm sure it, there will be uh, legislation on web accessibility, at least for, for public sector in, in Europe, in a year or two. And then we have a uh, uh, very exciting um, uh, and difficult assignment to, to, uh, to collect all the monitoring methodologies around in the member states today and validate them and see how they actually work uh, and see if they are reliable and see if we can learn something from, from the monitoring methodologies around there today, how they are used and, and what they can actually cover. And then to come up with recommendations to the Commission on how to monitor compliance of the upcoming web directive. And we only have a, a month to go before we should have the, the last report <laughs> written. So we really need to do the thinking now because now we have been working a lot with the analysis and, and collections and, and all of that and also working with advisory boards and national correspondents. But now we have to come up with a really clever thinking. Um, but um, what we have seen is that automatic testing can of course do uh, many things, but they are, uh, we have a, um, it's a huge gap between what all the automatic tools that we have been trying out, uh, what they can measure and what a good manual testing can actually me measure. But we have also seen manual testing uh, result that has been very bad. So manual testing isn't the answer as such. It ne needs to be manual testing with a very clear and structured methodology where it really says how are you going to measure things and how are you going to, um, to uh, to, to monitor and how are you interpreting the, the different things that you are actually measuring. Otherwise, manual testing is, is just a guess guesswork. Um, and also, of course, some of the things in the automatic testing tools are very interesting. For example, in, in Holland, they are doing large scale, very large scale automatic testing. And even if the results are not very reliable, they do see some things. For example, they see very clearly that some specific content management systems uh, are having specific problems. And because of how the market looks in, in the Netherlands, they could then um, go to this specific supplier and say, we are procuring uh, for all of the public sector and if you want, or if you're willing to fix the accessibility problems, then we, you will get all of these clients. And we, I mean, you can do a very direct procurement and having yeah. Um, a fantastic possibility to really change the market of the, I mean, the technical parts of the access, accessibility yeah. market. And nobody would have a, been able to uh, detect that possibility if they didn't have, if they hadn't done this uh, very large scale testing. And of course you can't do that I mean, if you don't have uh, an unlimited resource, which no one has, uh, then you can't do that many tests uh, manually. And you, I think even if we had done all of these tests, we, we probably would have it would have been lost in the big data <laughs> that so, we have collected. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting that you've got patterns emerging. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 
And, and so the automatic testing has, has some, some really interesting uh, positive uh, effects as well, and you can really, but you need to use it in a good way. And I think what we have really learned, what was uh, really clear from this research is that um, there is a large difference, and this is very important, between monitoring on a large scale to be able to sort of compare Greece with Bulgaria whoever thinks that's interesting. Um, but, uh, and it's a completely different thing to say, hey, Neil, your website is not accessible and you need to fix this and that, because that is more measuring or auditing your website, yeah. and that needs to be done in a qualitative way. Whereas if you just want to see sort of the trend in different countries, then maybe it's sort of good enough to do some um, automatic testing, as long as you don't believe that this is really accessibility testing. This is testing for compliance and you can just do small parts of it and they are not 100% reliable. So don't use it for measuring and trying to sort of teach the website owners or suppliers how to work with accessibility because that will completely fail. Okay. That's you need to yeah. de detect, the, uh, to, to see, to separate these two ideas. And most countries we have, uh, where we have tested monitoring methodologies, they try to do both. And that is extremely difficult. And you're going to need armies of, of <laughs> testers. <laughs> yes, but that's good. Let's have an, an army of accessibility professionals. That, that would be fine because, I mean, we need them anyway. So. Well, 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 we do. Um, and it's one of the reasons we set up an academy scheme in, in our organization because mm -hmm. we recognize that we need to encourage a yeah. new generation of accessibility people. But if I can just conclude on the, yeah. on the monitoring methodology thing, because that's what my head is full of now, is yeah. that um, I think, I hope, one of our recommendations will be to try to combine manual testing with uh, some sort of training. Because there are some countries that have been uh, trying to do this, and even if their methodologies are not perfect, I think you can learn something very interesting from there. You, do, you need to make the monitoring uh, in another way, but really uh, combine having the website owners to maybe doing self-declarations or self-assessments in a way that you do train them in accessibility in the same time. So they can't really answer the questions without going through a lot of, um, of training. And that way you can really achieve something, not only waste, sort of, sorry, I don't mean wasting, but not only use the money on monitoring, because we all know that we have problems, so who cares about the problems? I mean, why do we monitor? Why do we use a lot of money on this? The most interesting way to use the resources of taxpayers' money would be to actually do some, something, make something that is better. And, and so, upskill people. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So just don't, don't just audit things and, and sort of present the problems, solve the problems instead. That would be my, yeah. the most important recommendation for the Commission, to use the money in a wise way. And, and, and of course, what we want to be doing is comparing apples with apples, so having a standardized test testing methodology is really important so that yes. we, can, we can look across different nations and, and look at and, and see those patterns. Because yes, but why, yes, but why do we, I mean, how, how are we going to use that? I understand that the Commission wants to, to compare, uh, but, but really we already know that the southern European countries and the eastern European countries hit hardly hit, uh, that are hit by the uh, economic crisis that they are, have a generally lower accessibility than the Scandinavian countries or the UK so why do we need to measure that every no, year? I, I don't think it's I don't think you need to measure for point scoring purposes I think you need to measure for pattern recognition yeah um, for seeing trends and seeing where you can make a difference by doing things like um, leveraging procurement power and, yeah. and actually, I'm really pleased to hear that the Netherlands are doing it. We're also doing it with business in the UK. Yeah. So we're clubbing together and we're approaching large organizations that have a reputation for not being great with accessible mm -hmm. um, products and beginning to have conversations collectively and saying, we, we're your customer base. We understand that stuff's not particularly accessible now. We understand that you're not going to fix the old stuff. <laughs> but we want to work with you to make the new stuff much better. Yeah. Um, and that's beginning to pay off, and we're starting to have those discussions at a, a sensible level and, and um, with, with really large organizations. So I, I think that it has value in that sense, absolutely, yeah. to, to measure and compare, because then you can see the trends. Um, as, Antonio, as, you long, as long as the good, the well-performing countries don't think that they can be lazy cats and just you know, wait until Bulgaria is coming side by side with us, because that is also what 
could be happening, and, and that is what we are, why we are a bit skeptic to all of this, because we think that the Scandinavian countries being on the for, being the forerunners now. Oh, uh, you rest on your laurels. Yeah, yeah. that could that could be the the case. So yeah. that's also another thing. How can you compare and measure and have the same compliance level, but still sort of push for innovation and 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 push the well performing countries to keep on keep on pushing, keep on doing things. That is good. Antonio, you had a question. I think one of the key issues here is is to uh, try to convince that the universities should have accessibility training in the curriculum. I mean that that would be one way of of ensuring that designers and and developers and everyone that is working with with technology has some idea of accessibility at least when when they uh, get out of university. I think that is a that would move a lot of things and we are still not there. We are trying in the countries where we are where we are working, but, but none has really done this on a large scale, unfortunately. So I think that, that could change a lot. And I also believe that um, in some areas and regions and, and also on nationwide, uh, there are uh, competitions like hackathons and, and innovation competitions that, uh, that can give money to startups or, or small, smaller uh, SMEs and uh, just for, for doing sort of good things for accessibility and, and usability. And that could be one way of, of uh, trying to get people to, to look into this field. And uh, I've been in the jury of, of several of these uh, competitions and I think it's very easy for young people that are usually, if I can generalize, very sort of concerned about the environment and about uh, refugee situation and all of this. It's very easy as long as they get awareness uh, around accessibility issues, they, they really want to do the best thing they can. So I, I, I really believe we just need to stop talking to ourselves and start communicating to the rest of the world. Yes. Um, and then we can, all of these young people working with technology could really go, do a, a great difference. But uh, I think it's just ignorance that they have no idea that this problem exists and that's why they don't solve it. No, because at 18 you're immortal. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, one last topic I'd really like to get in before we close, and I'm happy to overrun slightly, is is the idea of getting end user involvement in standardization, because mm -hmm. this sounds really interesting to me. Yeah. What, what do you mean by end user involvement in, in standardization? Because from my experience, writing standards is is not something that end users would find very friendly. Well, I haven't yet met anyone thinking that writing standards is, is a nice thing to do. You usually say that it's a good way to lose friends and put family asleep. <laughs> so standardization is a, is a hassle, even if it's important. Yeah. But we have been working with uh, uh, especially people with cognitive disabilities uh, to ensure that this group can also uh, have a say when we work with uh, the ISO standards. We are trying to to uh, put cognitive accessibility in the sort of uh, limelight and, and that way we think it's important to also work with end users. And uh, uh, we have an industry PhD uh, on the Technical Royal uh, University in Stockholm working especially with uh, researching on cognitive disabilities and we have lots of, of persons with cognitive disabilities that we can um, uh, use is maybe not the right word but, but sort of uh, um, work together with. Uh, in these issues. And we have been um, trying to softly teach them a little bit about uh, standardization and uh, working with them on smaller parts, uh, picking out small questions and saying this is what are we going to discuss this day and then we have been using 
hours and hours and hours and we have done short meetings and they have been gone home resting and we have done another short meeting and we have been trying to just collect parts of the standards where, where we think that that could be interesting to discuss. And then we have actually had, um, the last time when the, it w there was an ISO meeting in, I believe it was in Japan, so it was in the middle of the night in Sweden, but we got people really engaged and the standardization group could send questions to our uh, panel of uh, people with, dis with cognitive disabilities in Sweden and they had discussions and then they came back with, with answers. So it has really been an, uh, a real live interaction, but of course, uh, driven by the fact that we have this group where we can work together and that they feel comfortable in that their uh, way of communicating is uh, sort of translated in a good way because not many of them speak English so so there's a sort of there are many hurdles or, or barriers on the way but uh, it's very rewarding to do this kind of work and and uh, I think we have been uh, doing things with these standards that have never been done before and and the other experts are extremely interested and we have had visitors from all over the world just looking into this research that we are doing so I I believe we're on to something really big here uh, and we, we would really like this to be um, a way of doing things with end users that can be used in, in many in many other uh, ways because it's not only about inviting the organizations it's about inviting individuals. That is also a very important note uh, to, to understand that the organizations, they have a political idea and that's very important and they need to be able to, to present that, of course. But just that, like the industry organizations sometimes are very hard to uh, work with in standardization because they tend to say no to everything. Yeah. Uh, End-user organizations can also be difficult when they are only sort of driving the political wills because then they tend not to listen to reason or, or other user groups. So having individuals that work with the standards that are uh, part, not part of the organizations, that can be much more rewarding because they can sometimes be much more open. And at least in, in Northern Europe, uh, the end user organizations are losing members. Normally, I think in, in Scandinavia at least, uh, around 10% of the target groups are actually members and active in the organizations now, and 90% are outside okay. of the organizations. So. Uh, and that is, of course, sometimes a problem because they lose momentum. Uh, but it's also very important to understand that when you talk to the organizations, you talk to, to an organization that has an agenda. And that is not always uh, for the common good of a standard, which needs to be uh, consensus-based. No, I agree. A, a lot of these organizations are also paid to play. And, and exactly. people are paying yeah. for a reason. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes. It, and, and there's another thing we're trying yeah. to do in Scandinavia, which I think is very important, and that is to make the industry, everyone that is working with end users, to understand that end users need to be paid for their work. And we're trying to write up a charter or a, a document for all the big industry, uh, everyone working with usability or accessibility or anything, but anyone that is working with end users, that the end users is, are going to be paid. And we want to have a standardized way of doing that so that, I mean, you're hap you can you are welcome to pay more, but at least you should pay this amount because many people with disabilities don't want to do testing because they are not paid, they are not acknowledged, yeah. they are not acknowledged, they are not, uh, I mean, they, they are treated very badly. And also what we have found when we are talking to end users is that one of the things they tend to dislike with, with participating in, in user tests is that they, they give a lot of information and they are uh, creative and, and, and doing a lot of things in this project and then everything disappears and they never hear from it again. So just having feedback uh, this is what the end result was, presented in a way that you can understand if it's a very complicated research report, then maybe do a summary so that the people that, that fed into this report understand what did we really, um, what is re the result here, what, we, what did we conclude from this, so that you get feedback, that's another very important thing. So we try to uh, change the whole way that the industry is working with, with end users. We're still having a long way to go, but, but we are slowly getting more and more interest in the work we are doing. I think it's, a, it's time that, we, that the end users get the payback. Yeah, I 100% I, I agree. I've, I've been working with end users too, um, doing quite a lot of interviews for um, some of the research we've been doing for cognitive accessibility for W3C, and particularly um, around areas which are less understood, like dyscalculia. Um, you know, there's such a, a lack of research that 
best way of finding out what works is to actually go and ask people. Yeah. Um, I'm, well, we're well over our half hour. Um, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Um, it's, can't wait to get you on Twitter this evening. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Susanna. Thank you. Bye-bye.